Hello, I'm Adair Margo, the founder of the Tom Lee Institute. It's a pleasure for me to share Tom Lee's story with you today. At the end, you may better understand why I selected his illustration of the lead steer, Old Blue, from J. Frank Doby's book, The Longhorns. In that book, it was said of Old Blue that his course was so unswerving, they thought he knew the North Star. Tom Lee knew the North Star too. He was born on July 11th, 1907 at 444 in the morning. His dad, who was mayor of El Paso from 1915 to 17 during the Mexican Revolution, said he'd be lucky as hell at craps. Mount Franklin was always present in his life. His mom said she could see it from her hospital window when he was born. And I can testify that it was there outside his window at Sierra Medical Center when he died. Tom always remembered his teachers and the public librarian, Maude Derlin Sullivan, who let him look through all the art books at the library. He didn't have an art class in school until his sophomore year with Gertrude Evans at El Paso High School. She got him involved in the school annual, and by senior year, he was editor-in-chief. While at El Paso High, Tom was part of an art club that met on top of apartments on the corner of Campbell and Yandel Boulevard. Tom would do portraits of friends on the roof of the building, including one of Helen Moore. This drawing was shown to a friend of his teachers who did illustrations for national magazines like the Saturday Evening Post. Recognizing Tom's talent, she suggested the Art Institute of Chicago would be a good place for him to go. There was a teacher there named John Warner Norton, a muralist, a good Western type, who had ridden with Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. That sounded like a good fit for Tom and Zola Lee's son. His first year at the Art Institute, Tom spotted a beautiful girl from Terre Haute, Indiana, named Nancy Jane Taylor, and they married in 1927. Tom made enough money to take Nancy to Europe in 1930 for the first time. There he said he found the pictures he'd been looking for his whole life with a special sentiment for the murals of Piero della Francesca. Upon returning to Chicago, John Norton knew he was dying of cancer and he encouraged Tom to take Nancy to his home country and begin rowing his own boat. Tom knew where he wanted to go, Santa Fe, the land of enchantment. He had spent summers during his childhood visiting a judge friend of his dad's, traveling from El Paso on the train. So Tom bought an old 1926 Dodge and drove Nancy from El Paso to Santa Fe in 1933. There, they built a one-room adobe home on the slopes of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains on land provided by Tom's friend, the painter Fremont Ellis. Tom worked for the Laboratory of Anthropology, doing illustrations of Indian pottery designs, just like he'd seen in his dad's studio, and working for Roosevelt's Works Progress Administration, doing paintings like these that are now in the collection of the Santa Fe Museum of Art. Life was good until one day Nancy got a pain in her side and Tom took her to the hospital in town. The next day a doctor they didn't know operated on her for appendicitis and the wound never healed. Nancy was in and out of the hospital. They had to leave their home and move to El Paso where she could be close to a doctor. And on April 1st, 1936, she died. Tom's grandmother and mother all died that year too. The important women in Tom Lee's life. It was a terrible time for Tom Lee. 
but work kept him alive, especially mural commissions being offered by the Treasury Department Section of Fine Arts under Roosevelt's New Deal. Here is Tom in his studio with drawings for his favorite mural, the one he worked on the hardest and researched the most for the historic federal courthouse in downtown El Paso. Named Pass of the North, it is arguably the finest mural of the period anywhere. Another person who came into Tom Lee's life was Sarah Dighton from Monticello, Illinois, who came to El Paso to visit a friend who had married an El Paso boy. When Tom looked at her over the dining table of their mutual friends, he knew Sarah was the one for him. He took her to see his mural Pass of the North on their first date, asking her to marry him. Although she said she would, he would have to meet her parents first, they married soon after with the $4,000 Tom Lee made from his Pass of the North mural. One day, Tom received a telegram that read, please wire collect, could you start work immediately on four portraits in color? Margaret Varga, Life Magazine. The U.S. was gearing up for war and Life wanted a front row seat. Tom became the first, accredited as a Life Artist Correspondent, traveling over 100,000 miles over four years. With a letter from Admiral King giving him free gangway on the ships of the Atlantic Fleet, he documented U.S. Navy destroyers protecting merchantmen carrying aid to Britain. When Tom asked Dan Longwell, the editor of Life, why he would send a kid from the desert to paint ships and the ocean, Dan Longwell responded, do you think I wanted to get a yachtsman who thought he knew everything about the sea? By God, I wanted a fresh view, and that's what I got. Tom's next assignment was living three months aboard the USS Hornet, the aircraft carrier Jimmy Doolittle and his raiders took off from to bomb Tokyo a mere four months before. His sketchbook is now in the El Paso Museum of Art collection. On Tom's next tour, he traveled halfway around the world to record the struggles of the Army Air Force's transport, fighter, and bomber crews in England, North Africa, and China in 1943. Tom requested to go with the Marines for his next assignment. He was a civilian and didn't have to go, but when the assignment was the tiny island of Peleliu to capture an airstrip protecting General MacArthur's flank for his return to the Philippines, Tom Lee chose to go. He said he'd know he was a fake for the rest of his life if he didn't. Landing on the 15th of September, 1944, about 15 minutes after the first troops hit the beach, Tom remained with Captain Frank Farrell and his men under fire for the first 32 hours of the assault. It was impossible for Tom to do any sketching or writing. His only job was to try to stay alive and he memorized what he saw. When he completed the pictures, taking them to life, at Rockefeller Center. They set the pictures up in a room along a shelf for the managing editor to see. When he walked into the room, Dan Longwell saw Tom Lee's paintings and said, print every damn one of them and I never want to see them again. After being sent to Mexico on one last assignment for life, a story on the history of beef cattle, Tom said he knew he couldn't say all he wanted to say about mankind's dying and living as a painter only. He taught himself to write, first writing a novel called The Brave Bulls, which was turned into a Hollywood movie starring Mel Farrar, its world premiere 
at the Plaza Theater. Its subject about a man facing death with courage was inspired by his years during the war. He also wrote A Wonderful Country, turned into a film starring Robert Mitchum, also with its world premiere at the Plaza Theater. Both were translated into many languages with the wonderful country tra retranslated into French again only recently. Other books followed. The Hands of Cantu, a novel about the training of horses in 17th century Nueva Vizcaya, now northern Mexico, including how the Spanish transported horses across an ocean and the two-volume history of the King Ranch. The Primal Yoke, set in Wyoming, a kind of Greek tragedy where nature kills a returning Marine. A picture gallery presenting Tom's experience says through his paintings and Crucible in the Sun about the King Ranch properties in Australia. The last decades of his life, Tom Lee focused on easel paintings. His last mural painting done in 1957 as a gift for the El Paso Public Library, the only work of art where his wife, Sarah, helped. Rio Grande hung in the Oval Office of President George W. Bush for eight years. It was moving to hear President Bush say that the Oval Office was not a dark and regal place, but a light and open place, just like El Paso's landscape, before pointing to Rio Grande. Mount Franklin is commemorated on Tom and Sarah Lee's cenotaph at the Texas State Cemetery on historic Republic Hill in Austin. Affixed to the granite is a bronze relief of old Mount Franklin, and etched into stone are Tom Lee's words. Sarah and I live on the east side of our mountain. It is the sunrise side, not the sunset side. It is the side to see the day that is coming, not the side to see the day that is gone. The best day is the day coming, with the work to do, with the eyes wide open, with the heart grateful. Thank you to all of you for being here today.